Good evening. I'm Leland Vitter. There's a lot of news to get to tonight, including some very promising developments on the COVID front. But we start with a terrifying development out of China. The Chinese military is playing a real-life game of battleship in a remote desert, getting ready for war with the United States. The Pentagon says they are worried, and as of now, there may not be much they can do about it. Take a look at these pictures. It's China's new missile and weapons testing facility in the southern part of the country, southwestern part of China, large desert. They have mocked up a U.S. aircraft carrier to test out their new anti-ship and hypersonic missiles. We zoom in, you can see the aircraft carrier there. Just in front of and behind the mock-up of the aircraft carrier, you can see it's mounted on a rail line. Well, why do that? How else do you test your missiles against a moving target? Exactly. The Chinese are testing how they can hit a moving U.S. aircraft carrier and then sink it. What would that mean? Likely many, if not all, of the 3,000 sailors would die. It's $3 billion worth of U.S. military hardware on the bottom of the South China Sea. The United States' ability to project force around the world comes in large part from our carriers. There are a few symbols of American power that rival a carrier. As one admiral put it to me, 100,000 tons of sovereign U.S. sea power and firepower anywhere in the world. The Japanese knew this as well. They sank 12 during World War II. During the Cold War, attacking carriers was a key part of the Soviets' battle plan, but they never got as close, anywhere nearly as close, to the carrier killer missiles that the Chinese are now testing. Carriers travel with a battle group, a dozen plus ships to defend the carrier and fight enemy ships or launch an invasion. The Chinese mocked up one of those as well. Here is their target of a U.S. destroyer that they can blow up in testing. A destroyer's crew is much smaller than an aircraft carrier, 300 or so sailors, but take out enough destroyers and the aircraft carrier becomes a very expensive sitting duck. You can tell a lot about an organization, a company, a military, by what they choose to focus the public's attention on. The U.S. military over the past year focused and highlighted its diversity as the Chinese focused on hypersonic missiles and carrier killers. Just this weekend, as the Chinese new testing facilities came to light, the U.S. Navy proudly announced the latest part of their diversity and inclusion programs, christening a ship named for Harvey Milk, the first openly gay elected politician in California. A transgender sailor got the christening honors. While we worry about critical race theory and strength through diversity in the U.S. military, China is building the world's next great superpower. You can see from this, they already have more ships than the U.S. Navy and, as noted, are advancing their technology rapidly. This map shows why it's important. That's not the map. That's the aircraft carrier. China's new missiles can attack carriers in their ports or Japan anywhere within nearly 1,800 miles of China's coast. That denies the Navy's ability to protect our most vital allies. For example, one-third of the world's trade goes through the South China Sea. If you think the supply chain crisis, the empty shelves crisis is bad now, just wait till the U.S. and Chinese Navy start mixing it up in the world's busiest shipping lanes. The Financial Times reported last week, China tells citizens to stockpile food as COVID controls are tightened. Communist Party newspaper says no reason for alarm, but admits families are running low on supplies. You can choose to believe that this is all a coincidence, but our military leaders do not. One general called China's testing of a hypersonic missile. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs said it was a near Sputnik moment. News Nation's Kelly Meyer questioned the Pentagon leadership today, joins us from Washington, D.C. Uh, we see what the Chinese are doing, Kelly. Is the U.S. doing the same thing? Well, today the Pentagon, Leland, wouldn't confirm that they've even seen these images or that the U.S. has the same practices in place. But there are major concerns that the Chinese government and their efforts to expand the military capabilities. The Pentagon spokesperson telling me that they are watching the actions of the Chinese military very closely. Is the speed and sophistication in which China has developed a concern for the Pentagon? Yes, of course, and it's all laid out in the China military report. We've been nothing but transparent and clear about our growing concerns over the kinds of capabilities uh, that the Chinese military is, continues to develop. 
And Leland, we spoke with the independent group who broke this news. They say that the Chinese are denying any knowledge of this site. Kind of fascinating that the Chinese got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. They, they often deny this stuff. Uh, how significant are these tests? What do they signif signify? Well, it means that the capabilities are advancing. The Chinese weapons technology is evolving at a rapid pace, and this all comes as tensions rise between the U.S. and China. They have a conventional warhead, and they can fire for more than 1,000 miles. And so the idea is, is from a, a land site in China, you could target a high-value U.S. ship like an aircraft carrier uh, with one of these weapons. And Leland, that was the reporter who broke the story. He also told us that what this shows is that they could be refining their targets, and no one quite knows what the capability of these new weapons are just yet. Leland? Yeah, you get to the point where the Chinese are denying this. You think that they were perhaps waiting to roll it out uh, sometime in the future. Kelly, thank you. Great reporting. As we reported, military leaders here at home are watching the Chinese military grow in several areas. The Hill puts it, China triggers growing fears for the U.S. military. The Chinese have tested its first-of-its-kind hypersonic missile. They've invaded Taiwanese airspace hundreds of times in recent months, all while the Biden administration is standing on the sidelines. The discovery of this new missile testing site is startling, to say the least. Seems as though it caught the Chinese and perhaps the Pentagon by surprise that it was made public. Times like this, we bring in Dean Chang, brings detailed knowledge of China's military space capabilities and their strategy as well. Uh, Dean, good to see you. Is there an explanation for this latest test site other than they want to be able to fight a war offensively with the United States? Not really. Um, but let me note here, I'm not quite sure, again, why people are so surprised. There have been reports along these lines. Um, there was a non-moving target identified roughly in the same area several years ago. That one actually had missile impact craters around it. It's very clear that the Chinese are you know, working on a variety of carrier killer weapons, including anti-ship ballistic missiles. Um, and as you go from the test, uh, you know, sort of the prototyping phase to deploying them in large numbers, you want to make sure they work. The, that the Chinese are doing this should come as no surprise to anyone. And you think about sort of the Chinese's rapid development here, uh, nuclear warhead production, now 350, 2027, 700, 2030, uh, at least 1,000. Uh, what are we to believe the Chinese intentions are? Well, uh, if you listen to the arms control community, this is a bunch of folks who simply are just scared of us. We're the mean, bad people who are out there threatening everyone, and all China's doing is is purely defensive. I think if you ask the Taiwanese, you ask the people in Hong Kong, you ask uh, Vietnamese fishermen whose boats were, have literally been run over by the Chinese, it's a somewhat different view. Xi Jinping has been pretty clear that the China dream is the revival of the Chinese people and China reassuming its proper place in the world, which includes being the center of Asia. That's the same Asia, of course, that produces most of the world's microchips, most of the world's computers, um, and as the Biden administration will remind you, most of the world's solar panels. And almost everything we buy on Amazon uh, as well. How do the Chinese view the U.S. and view the U.S. response when we find out about stuff like this? They view the United States as frankly, an existential threat, not to the Chinese people, but to the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. But let me note, Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership has long said the foremost priority for the CCP, for the Chinese Communist Party, is staying in power. So us being a threat to them being in power is an existential threat to, to them. Huh. Um, what do they think when we find out about this sort of thing? Um, they're probably not surprised. They know that we have satellites and things like right. that. Um, I'm just kind of curious whether or not uh, the Chinese were courteous and called General Milley to reassure him. <laughs> nicely played, nicely played, my friend. Uh, I guess, you know, you think about this and the way China has evolved and their technology has evolved. They've gone from sort of being an army of peasants 20 years ago now to near peer with the United States. Not quite there, but certainly there within the next five or 10 years and they've done a lot of it by stealing 
so many U.S. military secrets, whether it be with spies or with cyber espionage or the like. We've talked about it before. You think it's too late for the United States to put the Chinese back in their place without a war? I think every day that we insist that somehow uh, we should step back, we should you know, be more conciliatory, uh, lift sanctions on China, et cetera, is going to make it harder. Um, but I don't think it's too late at all. Um, frankly, it is never too late. The question is always going to be, however, what price in blood are we going to have to pay if it comes to a war? Um, because we chose not to put in the sweat equity beforehand. Yeah, well, or or the political capital as well that uh, would be needed to take the Chinese uh, on. Hey, Dean, uh, in, incredible insights. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. The next administration come by and take it away, just like the Dreamers have had. You know, they've essentially been a political piñata. That's the United States congressman, a Democratic U.S. congressman, fresh off their victory lap for advancing the infrastructure bill. Democrats have already found something new to fight about, immigration. Progressives are angry that full-scale amnesty is not included in President Biden's larger spending bill. Many feel betrayed by a Democratic Party that it made immigration reform a cornerstone of their 2020 campaign. Pablo Manriquez covers Capitol Hill for Latino Rebels. Few reporters are as well-sourced inside the Progressive Caucus joins us uh, now. Pablo, uh, is this fight for real? I don't think so. I think that... One of the things that I've been doing over the weekend was trying to figure out what exactly had caused the removal of certain provisions that immigrant rights groups have been fighting for throughout the Build Back Better negotiations. It was really interesting because a lot of people immediately wanted to point the finger at Democratic Party leadership, right? But multiple sources involved in this negotiation have since told me that while Speaker Pelosi, Dick Durbin, who's another really key negotiator on the immigration provisions in the Senate, uh, both, you know, sort of both major stakeholders within the negotiation on the congressional side held out until the last minute to include citizenship provisions. And it was actually uh, sort of grass tops immigrant rights groups fearing that they were going to come away with nothing that wanted that replaced citizenship with something that's like a temporary status called parole. So there's a lot of infighting right now amongst the immigrant rights groups. But I think that so far that most, uh, you know, first of all, Democrats have a united negotiating front on it in as much as it relates to we're just going to do what the immigrant rights groups want and the immigrant rights groups are completely in disarray well that's true well yeah that's interesting on the same time what the immigrant rights group really want is citizenship and it seems as though that's got right. been pulled off the table correct it's interesting how this has become a political football on both sides uh, and you pointed this out in one of your tweets uh poll support for work permits and protections for dreamers and undocumented migrants uh data for progress poll 75 percent support 20 percent oppose NRCC, National Republican Congressional Committee, 36 support, 56 oppose. How do you explain that and what does the difference mean? Well, it, the difference was in how they phrased the question. If you ask if you want to, like, forgive illegal immigrants of their sins or whatever, people are like, no. If you ask if people should be allowed to stay, work, be protected, and, like, sort of contribute to the American way of life, then people say yes. So, so it really who, depends on the winning, polling. Who's winning overall the debate on Capitol Hill on how to frame this? Oh, Republicans, always, always. Uh, Republicans have had a very lockstep talking point framework for describing immigration policy uh, in sort of like some of the more extreme ways that they can find, like using outliers as examples, that's been really effective politically. Uh, Donald Trump is probably one of the most famous purveyors of these messages, whereas Democrats, yeah, no, well, like, yeah, you know. Yeah, certainly think about how Republicans are able to do this when it comes to uh, victims of crimes by illegal immigrants and highlighting those, the Trump administration um, did that pretty well. It's even working, though, with Latinos. You and I talked about this. Glenn Youngkin in Virginia won nearly 50 percent of the Latino vote. Is, are Democrats losing this really key constituency? I think that failing to deliver on immigration reform is going to undermine the essential organizing backbone that immigrants have provided Democratic Party campaigns over the last several election cycles. If they come away empty handed on these negotiations, why, you know, there's a question as to whether or not that will affect Latino turnout, given how immigrant 
advocacy organizations at the grassroots level do turn people out. So that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think that uh, you know ultimately they are arguing right now for next to nothing in terms of immigrant relief when what's left in the Build Back Better Act, which begs the question, why not go down fighting for everything instead of next to nothing? Yeah, well, especially if you're seen as going down fighting, then you, you have something to stand on, a reason to... You have something to stand yeah, on, right. Like you, you, might a, not have, you might not be able to bring home the bacon, but at least yeah, no, you, you can you show have, that... Like, you, you have know, a moral victory, at least. I'm interested, because the, the other big immigration topic that's coming up is these payments to people or families, if you want to call them all, some weren't families, that were separated at the border under the Trump administration. The Biden administration has gone from absolutely not $450,000 to maybe something to now the DOJ is going to argue it and decide how much it should be. Here's President Biden over the weekend. Take a listen. Never mind the facts of this. I'm wondering how this plays politically. Do Democrats worry that payments to illegal immigrants is just not going to work well for them in the midterms? Well, it's payments to separated families. So I think that there's a distinction in the American political sort of debate about sort of, you know, the people who might who may who have come to this country illegally and are being persecuted, say, by ICE. But I think that like the border separations that went on during the Trump you know, um, I, I guess presidency what I'm saying you, were you just you yourself said Republicans unpopular. are better on this issue. I'm wondering if Democrats worry that it's going to be one more thing that Republicans can hang around their neck. Well, there's fundamentally, like politically, there's no difference between the worst set of like immigrant protections, like parole, and the very best amnesty. Republicans are going to blame it as like a mass amnesty okay. that needs to be repealed and replaced. Uh, you know, so th it's a messaging battle that if Democrats are take talking about degrees of relief, they're hey, playing hey, the Pablo, game wrong. <laughs> yeah. I got to run, but come back as this comes uh, through and build back better. We want to understand what what it means, especially uh, for the votes inside the Democratic uh, primaries coming up. Appreciate it, my friend. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Leland. All right. President Biden's approval ratings are at a new low. Will his big infrastructure bill turn that around? And vaccine mandates are sparking lawsuits across the country. Are their claims legitimate or can the government actually require vaccines for private businesses? The answer might surprise you. Schools different than employers. How long till this ends up at the Supreme Court? I think it's going to get to the Supreme Court fairly quickly, at least in terms of uh, the court being asked to stay the effects of the mandate uh, pursuant to some litigation uh, or other that is brought against it. Uh, and in fact, as you know, the, the mandate has already been stayed by the Fifth Circuit, although they haven't made it clear in their stay whether that's intended to apply to the entire country. Um, and that is something that, you know, we have seen throughout this kind of pandemic period. We've seen uh, vaccination mandates uh, being instituted by states and by institutions that have very quickly had rulings issued by district courts and then gone to courts of appeals and then gone to the Supreme Court. And yeah, no, as far, none of those have been uh, granted, but this yeah, may be it, it does feel like this one, in terms of the way the Fifth Circuit read it, I'm not a lawyer, but you are, and the way the, the Fifth Circuit wrote it, it seems as though there are clearly some issues that need to be uh, resolved here. This doesn't take into effect until January 4th, so it seems like the Biden administration knew that there was going to be a fight about this and they wanted to give it time to play out. Could you think of other ways, if the, vac if the Biden administration was really serious about a mandate and getting more people vaccinated, would it have been a lot easier to, say, tie vaccine status to welfare payments or to food stamps or to being able to get on an airplane? Wouldn't have that gotten a lot more people vaccinated a lot easier? You know, I don't know how effective that would have been. It certainly would have been politically more difficult, I think, um, because you're talking still about a, a much larger swath of the population. And there's been a lot of talk about how uh, the OSHA mandate reaches 80 million people, but that just means that there are 80 million people who work in companies that are affected. Two thirds of those are already vaccinated. And many of them are already under either private or state mandates requiring their vaccination. So it's, it's a much smaller segment of the population than the Biden administration has really sort of represented in their, um, in their discussions of this mandate. Um, but it's also, you know, it's easier to do it through OSHA, I think, than to try and do something through Social Security or yeah, it's some certainly, other kind it's certainly of way more political, pal politically palatable to blame it on the employers than it is to 
uh, all of a sudden be the ones to say, hey, you can't get on a plane to go visit grandma unless you've gotten the shot. Hey, Professor, uh, really appreciate your thoughts. Uh, this is going to keep going, obviously, and uh, we enjoyed having you talk about it. It's the first step in a waltz where you know, <laughs> I like I, I like that. Let the music out. begin, as they we say. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, sir. Sixty six billion dollars are being spent on expanding the US railways. Is there anything else that we could spend sixty six billion dollars on that would help America more than Amtrak? And President Biden's poll numbers have sunk to a new low. Will the newly passed infrastructure bill bring President Biden back? Steyer waltz up. This is the largest investment in roads, bridges, and highways since the creation of the interstate highway system, including the largest investment in our bridges ever. It's going to replace thousands of outdated buses with clean zero emission vehicles and aging rail cars with state of the art new ones. All right. It was a good day. Victory lap for the president's transportation secretary touting the newly passed infrastructure bill. Not so much for President Biden, whose job approval rating has sunk to a new low. 38%, a new USA Today Suffolk University poll found that nearly two thirds of Americans, 64%, do not want the president to run for reelection, including a number of people who voted for him. All right, we bring in Chris Steyerwalt of the American Enterprise Institute, friend of the show. Good to see you, Mr. Steyerwalt. I guess the silver lining here is for the president that these numbers, the polling was done before passing the bill and after the Virginia elections. Uh, does that change anything? Yeah, for sure. And remember, we ha we, you always have to think about why which people are upset. So you start out and 47 percent of the people are not going to like Joe Biden no matter what. They voted for Donald Trump. They're not going to like Joe Biden. That's where they're going to be. Then you talk about what is the difference between Biden when he was riding high uh, in the early summer, 53, 54 percent. Where did all that go? And the answer is pretty obvious. And we saw it reflected in the results in Virginia, which are that for the Democratic rank and file, the people who are lightly attached, they're not highly activated partisans. They're not uh, ideological. For these folks, things have been pretty rough, right? We're talking here about a lot of working class voters, uh, people who have We've been through two, uh, a, the resurgence of the pandemic. We Gasoline prices are through the roof. All of the things that would afflict a person and cause them to want change uh, are afflicting them. Now Biden has to hope that basically this is, uh, this, this is the snap in the line, that they took it out to, the, you know, and you can include Afghanistan, the Afghanistan debacle in this, that you go through all of this very rough sledding for Biden, gets through this stuff, and then, we get the comeback kid narrative and then things start to work. And the and, and the oh. even better news for Biden may be that the popular bipartisan infrastructure bill passed, but the other bill, which is much more controversial and much uh, less popular, may now fail because the squad in a fit of peak voted against it and thereby let all the moderates off the hook so they can now go tell them to go pound sand and oh. then go home and run. All right, and all of this is happening before Thanksgiving. We look more into the poll number. 16% of those who voted for him say he's doing a worse job than it's expected. Okay, that's not really that significant of a number. 44% of independents say he's done a worse job than expected. 64% don't want him to run again, so that's roughly 15% more than, as you point out, voted for him. Uh, one of the wisest political minds that I know and communication minds I know said that the one thing that a White House communications director must control is the conversation at Thanksgiving dinner in a positive way. Uh, what has to change between now and Thanksgiving for that to happen? Well, as an even greater communications uh, guru that I know of uh, said, control is an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he was an, he, so that, that communications friend was a, a very honest one as well. No, 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 I'm just saying. Every White House likes to think that they can shape the narrative and control this and control that. If people are paying three dollars and eighty cents for a gallon of gas, uh, and the and you still have to wear a mask uh, to go places and all of that stuff, if that's going on, people will be unhappy. Conversely, and we saw this with the jobs report. Look, the, probably the two biggest pieces of news 
uh, last week were not the Virginia election and the infrastructure bill, though the infrastructure bill is very important. It's probably that big jobs report that showed the economy coming back yeah. strong in July, number one. And number two, the development of antiviral drugs that will effectively end the pandemic. With, with the high vaccination rates that we have, and you combine it with that, that spells the end of the pandemic. And things could really turn the corner in the coming months. And if that's the case, then Biden is going to say, we planned it all along. This is exactly how we right. meant to do well, it. Well, you talk about, you talk about Thanksgiving, and we're already hearing this from the White House. Hey, last Thanksgiving, everybody was apart. This Thanksgiving, everybody's together. So be happy that you're all together and eating turkey. That helps. You brought up the Virginia elections, which has laid bare this divide in the Democratic Party, old, old world Democratic Party, new world. First, James Carville, the famed Clinton strategist, raging Cajun, explaining the loss, and then the new world of the Democratic Party explaining what James Carville doesn't understand. Take a listen to both. This <laughs> reminds me of when you and I used to talk vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Tea Party, the Freedom Caucus versus the, prog the moderate Republican Caucus circa 2010 or 2014. Well, and also, uh, Roland Martin tried to save it at the end, talking about that the Democrats should emulate the Lincoln Project, which, as close as I can tell, has been the greatest suck hole for money. It has been the greatest waste of money uh, since the Spruce Goose. So th that, that tells you how, how tight his political acumen is. The reality, and we saw it with the vote of the squad against this very popular infrastructure bill, his message, their message is one of electoral defeat. Their message is one for Democrats that says we will deny people what they want. And by the way, tragically, what they want too. That's legislation that they would have supported, but they voted against it to punish their fellow Democrats for not voting on things in the order that they wanted to. That is lunacy in politics because politics is the art of the possible, not the art of throwing a tantrum. Yeah, it's, it's additive, not subtractive. Well, you point out very well also that the uh, Lincoln, if the Lincoln Project is your moral North Star, you got uh, your own problems. Chris, good to see you. Thank you. You bet. You bet. All right. The only thing that appears to be worse than President Biden's approval numbers are those of his right-hand woman. Vice President Harris has a job approval rating of 28 percent, a historic modern era low. The new poll numbers come out as Harris leaves for a four-day trip to France to meet with the president, Emmanuel Macron. Joining us now, Dr. Lauren Wright, associate research scholar in politics and public affairs at Princeton University. Nice to see you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Um, Boy, is there an explanation even how it's possible to be this low? There's a lot of different explanations going around, and certainly it's happened before. Dick Cheney was at 30%. He was in the 30s for a few years yeah, there. Yeah, but that was after but he shot meaningful. somebody. What is it, Leland? I said that was after he shot somebody. Okay, so, but well, no, it was also in the wake of the Iraq war. Yeah. It was when the war on terror was becoming very unpopular. But yes, 28% is meaningful. It's rare for people to have a strong opinion of vice presidents and to really care and pay attention to what they're doing. And that's different about Kamala Harris. She is more divisive than a typical vice president. You think about what 28% represents in America. 28% of people will visit a garage sale in the summer. 28% of people carry gum on them at all times. 28% of Americans bought viral stocks during the game stock surge. And the media has a 36% approval rating. Uh, like a third more Americans trust the media than they do approve of, of the vice president. Can you recover from that? Sure. Uh Americans have very short political memories. Yeah. And as you were just talking about with Chris, you don't really know for sure what things are going to look like a year down the road. But there have been these sorts of issues with Vice President Harris since she ran for president in 2020. There are leaks from her office. There are negative news reports. Uh, she doesn't do particularly well in high pressure interviews. And she's been giving this wide net of responsibilities that, yes, are very difficult issues to solve, like immigration. But there's really not a single message coming from her that syncs up with her strengths. For, um, for instance, I've written about how she should be the White House's face 
um, against the Texas abortion law. That's an issue where she has a lot of credibility, but instead she's doing these things. She's at NASA, she's going abroad to talk about climate change. Yeah, you think uh, about it, going seems abroad. seems to be no cohesive strategy. Yeah, going abroad as, as evidenced by her disastrful interview with Lester Holt, probably not uh, her strong, strong suit. You think about the other vice presidents, you brought this up, uh, Dan Quayle, Al Gore, Dick Cheney, uh, Joe Biden, only Cheney came close in his lowest approval rating. That was after he shot somebody in, in the midst of a, a very unpopular war at the end of his term. Is there ever been a time where you get this 10 point divide where the vice president is so much less popular than the president? It's very rare. Uh, although certainly we've been seeing Biden's approval sink too. And so they're probably yeah. interrelated. Uh, but we typically see, and what we've seen throughout history, is vice presidential approval usually tracks very closely with presidential approval. People don't pay very much attention to the vice president. That's good from a messaging standpoint sometimes because you just want someone to go out there and double down yeah. on what you're saying or stand in for you at these ceremonial events. But when people have a strong opinion and they're paying attention, uh, that can bring good attention or it can bring very negative yeah. news stories. And least, Vice least, President Harris has had some of that. Yeah. At, least, at least in the very beginning, uh, it was always that Kamala Harris was going to be the last voice in the room and it was almost a co-president in the beginning. You saw them together so much. Clearly that, uh, that has changed. The imagery has changed. The messaging has trained, changed. Uh, Dr. Wright, good to see you, ma'am. Thanks, Leland. All right. Taxpayers are spending billions, tens of billions of dollars on 1850s technology. Who in their right mind thinks Amtrak is really the future? Welcome back. Aviation began in America, changed the world. You can now fly from sea to shining sea, New York to Los Angeles on an airplane. That airline will pay taxes. Flight takes six hours and it costs $94. On taxpayer subsidized Amtrak, that same trip takes three days, 12 times as long, and costs three times as much. Yet, Amtrak is getting $66 billion in additional taxpayer dollars from what they already get for expansion. Here's the CEO of Amtrak explaining what President Biden's infrastructure bill means for his money losing enterprise and some of the new routes we'll see. Phoenix to Tucson is a great example, or, or you know, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, uh, Cincinnati, uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, to Las Vegas. When you think of the challenges America faces, getting from Phoenix to Tucson is certainly on top of the list. In case you're wondering, there is a major highway connecting the two. We all paid for it. It takes less than two hours to drive. As for Los Angeles to Las Vegas, the airlines fly that route hourly, those airlines pay taxes, one way, $39. The same price to fly from Washington to Boston in about an hour. That route by comparison is cheaper if you take Amtrak. After all, we all subsidize Amtrak so they can charge $35. It takes eight hours, eight times as long. I could go on and on. Reasonable people can agree, with the exception of Washington to New York, Amtrak is a boondoggle. And on its face, a complete waste of your tax dollars, for example. The $66 billion given to Amtrak could roughly double the amount of food stamps given to needy and hungry families. It could build an accessible home for every veteran that lost a limb in the Iraq and Afghanistan war and still have $65 billion left over. Perhaps more pressing and relevant after this show, we could buy five more aircraft carriers that would get the attention of the Chinese and the rest of the world as well. But no, we aren't going to do any of that we are going to build a rail link between Cleveland and Columbus. At least one man is very happy about that. Jim Matthews, president and CEO of the Rail Passengers Association, joins us now. All right, Jim, uh, what did I get wrong? Um, well, not to be rude, but just about all of it. Okay, go ahead, <laughs> tell me. First of all, uh, let's, let's talk about what reasonable people can talk about with Amtrak. Listen, passenger rail in this country is, a lot, is about a lot more than going from, say, Los Angeles to Chicago. Um, and if you think for one minute that those airlines are paying the full freight of what it costs to operate that $39 flight, not true in the least. Every mode is subsidized, airlines included. We pay 
air traffic controllers, a median salary of $130,000 a year. And we have 14,000 of them on the federal payroll. Do you know why that is? Because we have the safest air transportation system in the, in the world. And the reason we do that is because it's a public good. And that's not something the airlines pay for, that's something that the federal government pays for, and correctly. Amtrak is in the same boat. Amtrak provides a vital service to places where private industry cannot profitably provide it. And but, every but, time oh, wait, we spend on. the money, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you bring it up. What, but what vital, what vital service do they provide that you couldn't provide cheaper with buses? Because it's certainly not New York to Los Angeles. Have you ever tried to take a bus across rural Montana in the winter? No, but is, again, should that be should should that be subsidy? Is that really the best use of sixty six billion dollars? It's the best use of connecting the entire country together, so that all of the people who live in this country and vote in this country can participate in its economy. It's not about connecting Los Angeles or New York or Philadelphia. It's about places like Cut Bank, Montana. It's about places like Marks, Mississippi, and it's about places where bus service alone is not going to do the job, particularly in places where the roads are poor and the roads are more dangerous. Remember, roads are 17 times more dangerous than flying or taking a train. I, I would actually think alone, they'd be even, even more dangerous let, than that. But let, let alone, let me, let me make one more point. You know, grandma has supplemental oxygen. She has a powered wheelchair. None of those things are going to go on the bus, and you certainly don't want to drive it. So are oh, we okay. saying that she just has to stay home? All right. Well, I, I, your 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 point your points are well taken. I'm just, still haven't figured out what I got wrong, but I'm glad you had we heard your view on it. We got to run. We're out of time, but uh, we're going to have you back, Jim. This is a great conversation. I appreciate You're a good it. Good sport. Yeah. Thank you. A real life version of the movie Love Actually. When we come back. As Hugh Grant said, and. 2003, and it's true today, there's a lot of discussion of hatred and greed. We've reported on a few of them during the show tonight. But there are far more reasons to be optimistic. Here are a few. COVID's quickly moving to the rearview mirror. New drugs promise to prevent death in virtually every case. Chris Steyerwald talked about that. The unemployment rate is now below 5%. Your 401k is at or near a record high. I could go on, but one other video struck us. We wanted to show it to you. For all the talk of the supply chain crisis, as you know, we call it the empty shelves crisis here, thousands of people lined up in the wee hours of the morning in Mexico and in the United States to come to America for reunions, but also they came to America to shop because things are cheaper here and easier to find. One currency exchange on the Mexico side of the border ran out of U.S. dollars as people came to Walmart and Costco in America for the first time in two years. It's a subtle but important reminder that for all our flaws, America is still the best place in the world. People line up to come here. Dan Abrams next. We're going to leave you with a few more reunions. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.